Good morning. Um, I'm going to continue my my talk on uh, called entitled "Are You a Rebel or King James Bible Believers?" Um, Want to go over today? I'm going to begin with um, the traditional fundamentalist view of the Bible. Now, the foundational importance of the Bible and Protestantism was expressed very clearly in the 17th century by Anglican divine William Chillingworth when he declared emphatically, quoting, the Bible, I say, the Bible only is the religion of Protestants. Um, and that is that is from William Chillingworth, the religion of Protestants, a safe way to salvation, 1638, uh, page uh, 463. In the 19th century, Presbyterian theologian Charles Hodge, in his three-volume work, Systematic Theology, stated in <clears throat> excuse me, 1873, quoting Martin Luther's 1537 small called articles, that, quote, all Protestants agree in teaching that the word of God, as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only infallible rule of faith and practice. And this is from Charles Hodges' Systematic Theology, um, Kindle Edition. So that was uh, 1873, originally. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, this view was affirmed by a Baptist theologian in the 20th century as fundamentalism was moving away from a cross-section of conservative Christian denominations and was focused more and more in the Baptist faith tradition. This traditional view of the Bible's importance of fundamentalism was expressed in an even more extreme manner by Henry Clarence Thiessen in his introductory lectures in Systematic Theology. Quote, it, what he called the true church, bases its view on the belief that the Bible is the embodiment of a divine revelation and that the records which contain that revelation are genuine, credible, canonical, and supernaturally inspired. That's from Henry Clarence Thiessen's introductory lectures. Systematic Theology, page 79. The fundamentalist view of the divine inspiration of the Bible had its origins in the Princeton Seminary in the 19th century. In 1879, a doctrine was expressed that insisted that the in original autographs of the presumed Bible writers and those writings only were inspired by God, inerrant and infallible. Um, all subsequent translations attained to varying degrees of reliability and trustworthiness. This allowed a fallback position from the assault on the truth of the Bible narrative by German biblical criticism and the acceptance of Darwin's version of the theory of evolution to a Bible that didn't actually exist in reality, as the original autographs were never in one Bible and were themselves not extant so they could not be questioned. The mark of fundamentalism in America was a conservative, literal approach to scriptural interpretation and a belief in the divine inspiration of the original autographs with translations being trustworthy, but not perfect. It reduced divine inspiration to mere transmission from God to writing on a single occasion. Um, and you can read more about that in Ken Robert Trembath's Evangelical Theories of Divine Inspiration, a review and proposal from 1987, page 15. Presbyterian pastor Archibald Alexander Hodge, son of Princeton Seminary theologian Charles Hodge, wrote in 1863, that what the Bible calls, quote, given by inspiration is revelation, while inspiration referred only to the process of writing an infallible and inerrant document. And you can read that in his book, Outlines of Theology from 1863, page 68. That this did not include any translation is apparent. American Baptist minister and author, Dr. Waylon Hoyt, speaking at a conference held on biblical inspiration in Philadelphia in 1887 said, Quote, but neither for version nor manuscripts is inspiration to be claimed. Inspiration is only to be claimed for the primal sacred autographs. And he goes on later, we affirm inspiration and authority of the original scriptures, the sacred autographs, but not of the copies or versions. That's Waylon Hoy, questions concerning inspiration in the inspired word, a series of papers and addresses delivered at the Bible Inspiration Conference, Philadelphia, 1887. That was published in 1888. But the King James Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is given by inspiration. And in the only other place where inspiration is mentioned, Job 32.8, states that God's inspiration gives men understanding. 
Peter, writing in 2 Peter 3.15, said that Paul wrote by the words given to him, both understanding and wisdom implying God's revelation of himself to the writers, as well as the wisdom to write. In Jeremiah 36, 32, the originals being burned in a fire are rewritten with the addition of many words. So the question of God inspiring only the original autographs is apparent. Which originals? Also in 2 Timothy 3, 16, quote, all scripture is not likely referring to the original autographs as it is highly unlikely that Timothy had access to the original autographs of Moses' more than 1,000-year-old writings, but to only copies and translations. Added into the mix was the effort to revise the AV completed by the Anglican Church's bishop, Westcott, Hort, and Company in 1881, unrelated either to the Niagara Conference or the Princeton Seminary's thoughts on the inerrancy and infallibility of the original autographs. New manuscript discoveries of a non-biblical nature that were believed to shed light on the original Bible languages and dissatisfaction with the perceived archaic English of the authorized version led to the Anglican Church's 1881 revision of the King James Bible. The revision was the first effort in 250 years with any Anglican Church authority behind it to revise the King James Version. Plans for a revision of the AV were in work since at least 1820 when Anglican Bishop Herbert Marsh, in a lecture on the interpretation of the Bible at Cambridge, published in 1828, called for it as necessary. This struggle to have, <coughs> excuse me, the idea of a revision seen through happened in fact, even though many, such as philologist and pioneering American environmental conservationist Charles George Perkins Marsh, said that a multitude of Bibles would result from such a revision, dividing Protestantism and causing more harm than good. The revision committee, laboring for over a decade, published its works in 1881. The revision efforts consisted of an English committee headed by Anglican bishops Westcott and Hort, and an American committee headed by biblical Bible scholar and historian Philip Schaff. The resultant revised version of the Bible and its American counterpart, the American Standard Version, were not so much revisions of the authorized version, but new versions of the Bible based on an entirely new background text for the New Testament and a departure from the traditional Old Testament text. This effort did not escape criticism. John Bergen, a noted expert on Greek language and manuscripts, panned the revision efforts in 1883, and he wrote, and all these references, if you ask me, I'll provide them for you, no problem. He wrote, quote, the new Greek text, which in defiance of their instructions, the revisionists of the authorized English version had been so ill-advised as to spend 10 years in elaborating, was a wholly untrustworthy performance, was full of the gravest errors from beginning to end. Philip Schaff, the head of the American Revision Committee, Acknowledged that one reason for the difficulty the new text had in being favorably received was that for the great mass of English readers, King James Version is virtually the inspired word of God. Um, now, next, I'm going to talk about the fundamentalist response to the Anglican revision of the King James Bible uh, and then move on from there as I lay the groundwork for my argument as to why you should be using the King James, <coughs> excuse me, the King James Bible. I, I do appreciate you listening. Sorry about my throat this morning, but we'll continue this uh, next time and uh, have a great week.